Are robots taking over our jobs, and will we be paid for the jobs that are left? Barbara Ehrenreich joins us to talk about her cover review of two new books, Rise of the Robots and The Shadow Economy. And, you know, decisions are made, have been made again and again in favor of uh, reducing human labor in the interest of profit. How well does Oliver Sacks tell his own story? Andrew Solomon will join us to talk about Sacks' new memoir, On the Move. In this book, I felt as though there was a really deep humanity, as though he admitted to the ways in which he was damaged. I, I liked him a lot more after this book than I've liked him before. Alexandra Alter will share her notes from the publishing world. And Greg Coles has bestseller news. This is Inside the New York Times Book Review. I'm Pamela Paul. Barbara Ehrenreich joins us now. She reviews on our cover this week two books, Rise of the Robots, Technology and the Threat of a Jobless Future by Martin Ford and Shadow Work, the Unpaid, Unseen Jobs that Fill Your Day by Craig Lambert. Barbara, thanks so much. Oh, delighted. Delighted to talk about this cheerless topic, (laughs) but a timely one. Let's start off with Martin Ford's book, Rise of the Robots, Technology and the Threat of a Jobless Future. This is not a new topic, but what is new in his exploration of it? Well, I I think he's one of of quite a few commentators who have pointed this out. There's been a, oh, going back to the 60s, probably, and even earlier a little bit, quite a discussion. Uh, at least among kind of experts, about automation. And then later, um, you know, robotization and computerization of everything. And what this means uh, for the humans amongst us. Martin Ford's book, as far as I can see, is one of the most concise, reasonably argued, of anything I've read on the subject. He's very thoughtful. He's not... He doesn't make um, wacko predictions, but he just shows how things are going, as far as I could see. Who is Martin Ford? What's his background? He's a a Silicon Valley software entrepreneur. Uh, So he's not somebody I was familiar with, but clearly he knows that world and has really immersed himself in a lot of economics. Uh, too, for, for the writing of this book. So that makes him different because I think it's it's often sociologists or political commentators or people who, um, e- economists talking about this, but he's coming from within the world of technology itself and having this argument. Yeah, he's part of the wrecking crew, you might say. <laughs> what is exactly his argument? What is he saying? <laughs> it's not a mea culpa kind of thing or mm-hmm. yeah, anything like that. It, what comes through very clearly in this is how market forces also ch- uh, control the direction of change. It isn't just the technology as a big engine uh, autonomously, you know, running amok, but that, you know, decisions are being made everywhere along the line. Should we have more employees or reduce it to almost no employees? And, the, you know, decisions are made, have been made again and again in favor of, uh, reducing human labor in the interest of profit. And there are certain areas of the job force that have succumbed to this already. But he talks about new areas that have become vulnerable. Whose job is next on the line? Uh, I'm afraid ours are. (laughs) Uh, That's a terrible thing to say. But, you know, it struck me reading this book that he's talking about, um, you know, computers, software already infringing, say, on the area of writing writing articles. Now, so far, they're doing pretty simple-minded articles about sports or, uh, well, business. What Ford shows is how these, these programs, these algorithms, could become more subtle, more nuanced. And, of course, they can, you know, gather up so much more information and synthesize it than a mere human. But as I was writing, thinking about what's writing for the review, it struck me, a computer will eventually do this better because it will have read all of Martin Ford's work. It will have read all of the other articles in, and books in the area, and it will, it will have the capacity to synthesize these in a way that my little 
organic brain can't do. <laughs> so is he saying that, you know, that we, we, we used to think of this as sort of assembly line manufacturing blue collar jobs that are being lost to the forces of technology. And now it's the uh, people who work in finance and law and journalism who are next to go? Yes. Okay, well, that's exciting. Um, <laughs> For quite a while, the idea has been that, to put it crudely, the only the dumb jobs uh, could be automated. Too bad for those assembly line workers. But, you know, they should have, they should have gotten a college education, right? They should have uh, had. They should have master's degrees in something. Right. And that has not worked out. So that one undercurrent throughout this book is a refutation of the idea that education is a solution. Education in what? When you get to the point where um, computer algorithms can grade essay question answers on college exams, then. I feel threatened, personally. <laughs> right. I don't know about you, but that's getting a little close. The subtitle is The Threat of a Jobless Future. That does sound bleak. Does he see some way out of this? Does he say, well, don't study X, Y, and Z in college, do another suite of, of classes? Or does he see, there a, is there a political solution or a technological solution to this? No. I would say the advice if you can call it that at the end, but that, that, that stands out, it is quite bleak. That without jobs, we still have to think of how people are going to live. Uh, and he proposes something that's a very old idea, once shared by Richard Nixon, uh, that there be an annual guaranteed wage mm -hmm. uh, for everybody. So the, the, the impact of this is not starvation. But he talks about $10,000 a year, which is below the poverty rate for the household minimum poverty rate, correct? Well, I, I, you know, I've thought about this and wondered, maybe if you had five children and they each are getting their $10,000, that would work. Uh, but it certainly will not work for a family. Right. Or even, you know, one individual. Right, right. Because that, that, that's below the poverty line. Well, below, yeah. No, for one person, the poverty line is, I don't know, 15, 16. Right. It's, a, it's something also very unrealistic, depending on the area of the country, but still. Okay, so, so that's Martin Ford's book, Rise of the Robots, which basically says your paid jobs are going away. Um, you, we paired this with another book, um, Shadow Work, The Unpaid, Unseen Jobs That Fill Your Day by Craig Lambert. He's saying that not only were, if you look at the two together, it's, your paid job is going away, but you can do all this other stuff for which you won't get paid. Yes. It's a fun book because it, it, it really got my hackles up. You know, with the, there are so many small annoyances, and, and a lot of them brought by technology. I consider the problem of creating passwords, and sometimes they're required to periodically update them, or you should. I have no idea how to handle that. <laughs> and I lose them. It, you know, just, it, that in itself generates work. Cleaning out my inbox, deleting spam. These are the kinds of things that Lambert talks about. He also talks about the way service businesses expect we, the customers, expect us to do more and more of the work which they once employed people to do. So when I go to Panera's, I know I have to place my order, or I have to carry my tray to the table, I have to bust the, the, the dishes and everything. You know, we take that now for granted. You know, the idea that there are so many little chores we have to do, because by so doing, we're either making somebody money or saving them some money. You mentioned uh, passwords, which is probably uh, the thing that makes me angriest in terms of unpaid work, other than the unpaid work that parents are expected to do, especially in schools. Um, but he has a whole chapter on shadow work in home and family life. What do people have to do at home and family life that they didn't used to have to do? Well, I'm old. I'm a grandma. But I never heard of parents doing homework or helping their kids with homework. Uh, and I had you know, a, um, a lot of encouragement in my home as a child, and my own children had a lot of encouragement, but they did their homework. 
And, that's, you know, that was their problem. Right. Now, I think the expectation is that parents have at least two hours a day to spend doing homework with a child. Now, Lambert tries a study that shows this doesn't actually improve the child's performance. Neither does homework, even when they do it themselves. So it would be miraculous. If... Good point. Good point. But I, you know, I have seen parents uh, take on children's uh, science projects almost as their own. Not to mention many other things. Not to mention all soccer mom phenomenon, but we're not. Part of that is upper middle class anxiety mm-hmm. about children's academic performance. But another part of it is the schools just don't have the resources to do what they need to do by way of teaching. So that they're not, they don't have enough money to pay actual teachers and support staff to accomplish the education. When you're called upon as a parent, or grandparent in my case, to essentially be an unpaid tutor, it's maddening. When you read these two books together, Rise of the Robots and Shadow Work, What did you come away with? What sort of vision of working America? I guess working working Americans, isn't that the new uh, catchphrase for what we call middle class people? What does this look like? Well, I wish Craig Lambert had been more directive in his book. Not that he should be fair to expect it. uh, But I I wish he'd call for a general strike uh, by all of our shadow workers. No. I'm not, my passport is going to be zero, 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 et cetera. And, and, you know, just backing off, uh, no, I can't do um, two hours of homework in addition to all the other things I have to do, et cetera. I wish he'd, he'd done that, because I think we do have to reclaim our own time. But I think what is left hanging in Martin Ford's book is the old question, which put more optimistically put, would be, is what would we do if we were free from a lot of kinds of work? I don't think we're all just going to lie around and drink beer. I think, I think people are going to be very creative. Mm-hmm. If the pressure is off them, there could be an explosion of the arts, a sort of crowdsourced science, of civic engagement and participation. That would be the bright side. That would be the, the all the opportunity costs of what we're not able to do because we're so busy coming up with new passwords. Yes, <laughs> for example. But it's suppose we didn't have to have our paid jobs because computers are doing them better. And we, we don't have to do the silly make work uh, that is demanded of us. Uh, what, what, would we, what would we actually like to do? What is it to be human? That's what sort of hangs around the corner in both of these books. Well, I don't know if we're going to have the answer uh, right now here on the podcast, but uh, Barbara, thank you so much. Oh, my pleasure. The books again are Rise of the Robots by Martin Ford and Shadow Work by Craig Lambert. Barbara Ehrenreich reviews both of them on our cover in a terrific review essay called Welcome to Your Obsolescence. Thanks again. Alexandra Alter joins us now. Hi, Alexandra. Hi, Pamela. What's new? So there was a book announced this week by Random House, which caught my eye because it was a cookbook, but it's connected to a series of fantasy novels. If you like 18th century Scottish food, or perhaps more likely if you're a fan of Diana Gabaldon's time travel series, Outlander, Random House is publishing the perfect book. It's called Outlander Kitchen, and it's a recipe book that's inspired by the novels, which are about a nurse who time travels back to 18th century Scotland. Uh, The author is Teresa Carl Sanders. She's a professional chef, and apparently she's a massive fan of the show. She's been posting recipes on her blog since 2011. And if you want a sort of taste of what is on her blog and what will probably be in the book, the recipes are sort of classic Scottish dishes like roasted pork tenderloin with cider sauce, neeps, and tatties. 
Haggis. Definitely haggis. You know what I'm looking forward to more than that, I have to say, is the Confederacy of Dunces cookbook. You're kidding. Which is coming this <laughs> fall. I am not kidding. I, I, I'm wondering about what kind of hot dogs we may be allowed to eat. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, this has apparently become a subgenre of cookbooks. It's sort of become a thing for hardcore fans of, of novels who are taking their fervor a step beyond just going to conventions and dressing up. And instead, they're basically creating recipes and cooking and eating the food in some of their favorite books. Um, I've found a few more. There's a Twilight cookbook, of course, called Love at First Bite. I heard that and thought you meant Twilight Zone. And I thought, well, that sounds interesting. Twilight Zone cookbook. I'm sure there must be one. We'll have to search. There's, of course, a Harry Potter cookbook. And then there's some cookbooks based on series that you wouldn't necessarily want to eat the food in, like, say, The Hunger Games. Well, you know, you don't really want to eat the Harry Potter every flavor jelly bean. (laughs) I've been there, and I do not recommend trying the vomit jelly bean. (laughs) Then I found there are two rival cookbooks based on George R. R. Martin's uh, series, A Song of Ice and Fire, which spawned, of course, the hit show on HBO. And some of these books have recipes that are only for the very strong-willed, hardcore fans and those who are not faint of heart. For example, spiced honeyed locust, jellied calves brains, and grilled snake. Yum. All right. (laughs) Thanks, Alexandra. Thanks for having me. Andrew Solomon is here. He is the president of PEN America and author, among other books, of Far From the Tree, Parents, Children, and the Search for Identity. Hi, Andrew. Hi. What a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to have you. And we're not talking about your um, incredible last book, Far From the Tree, but about On the Move, Oliver Sacks' new memoir, which you review in this week's issue of the Book Review. I feel like Oliver Sacks is one of those people that many people know what he does, but they don't necessarily know who he is. So who is Oliver Sacks? Well, that's part of what's wonderful about this book is that he opens up in it about many things he's previously not spoken of. He talks about being gay and about what it was like for him growing up being gay, about his mother saying that she wished he were dead when he told her. He talks about how he really came to understand medicine through narrative and what it was like to be effectively a storyteller who was practicing as a doctor and what that awakening was like. And he describes the ways in which he has been quite eccentric, lived a life that was in some ways quite lonely, but very much imbued with a passion, not always for individual human beings, but always for humanity. The book he did just before this, um, Hallucinations, was also surprisingly revelatory in that um, in the excerpt that ran in The New Yorker first, he confessed that he had been a drug addict, something I think not many of his uh, fans and readers and followers uh, had known about. Does he write about that in this as well? He does write about his very heavy drug use, and he writes about some rather frightening experiences. He doesn't repeat the material from hallucinations in detail. What's striking, though, is that it's sometimes felt in his earlier work as though he's very much focused on the vulnerabilities of his patients, but he's remained invisible. And it seems as though in these last couple of books, but especially in On the Move, he's decided to make um, his own vulnerability apparent. He's treated himself in the way he treated his patients. And it's very moving to see that shift. Did you feel like the Oliver Sacks that you uh, went into the book kind of knowing or knowing about was different from the one you emerged after reading the book with? I've sometimes felt that the Oliver Sacks I had from his previous books was a little ungenerous. He seemed to be focused on his patient's defects in what often seemed like a slightly distanced uh, way. And in this book, I felt as though there was a really deep humanity, as though he admitted to the ways in which he was damaged. I I liked him a lot more after this book than I've liked him before. He has a number of detractors, even though he's a best-selling author. Um, What's the controversy about what he does in his books? I think the controversy in some of his previous books has been about the idea that he exposes his patients in a slightly freak showy way. I mean, there's been an element in some of them of, you thought that was weird, wait till you see this one. Right. Um, in this book, I think he moves away from that perspective. Now, I should say that his other books are also enormously accomplished, that he's brought a range of neurological deficits into the public eye where they wouldn't otherwise have been, that he's described different ways of thinking and really increased our appreciation for what's broadly called neurodiversity, which is a variety of ways 
of thinking. But in this book, somehow by uh, coming into the personal, he strengthens the arguments of all of his previous books. I think I'd read them now with a slightly different and a perhaps happier eye because I feel the generosity with which he has described himself casts a different light over the way he's exposed his patients. There have been a number of doctors um, in recent years who have published books about their practice. Um, Atul Gawande, of course, with Being Mortal last year and previous books. Uh, Jerome Groupman, um, Sherwin Newland. Where does Oliver Sacks fit into this group? Was he one of the first of this wave of doctor writers? There have always been doctor writers. I mean, there are descriptions um, that were written by Galen um, uh, 2,000 years ago. It's a genre that's existed for a long time. I think what's striking about the authors that you've just described is the way in which all of them aspire to tell a larger story. They're not simply speaking about what has happened to their particular patients, but trying to describe how those stories of their particular patients illuminate basic truths about the human condition. There's none of them who seems to me to dread um, so sort of fine a balance between the medical and the anecdotal. Somehow, Oliver Sacks has made the stories he's told completely riveting to people who have no interest in the medical issues he's describing, and has managed, I think, in doing that, to change to some degree the way that physicians interact with their patients. What is that larger mission? Is it to change the relationship between doctor and patient, or is there a larger point that he's making about neurodiversity? We've had a tendency for medicine to revert to science and to revert to numbers and to revert to mathematics and to revert to cell mechanisms and to be described in very logical, rational terms. And what Oliver Sacks has done is to say there are those ways of describing these illnesses, but the experience of illness is actually a human experience and it involves emotions and it involves despair and it involves hope and it involves a distorted sense of reality. And his focus really has been on saying we cannot provide good medical treatment simply because we advance in science. Really good medical treatment also involves the ability to see our patients as human beings and to interact not only with the specific symptoms of what they immediately have, but with the larger cause of their personality, their position in the world, and their knowledge of themselves. How did Oliver Sacks get into this business um, of of these particular case histories, of writing about them? Where was he born? Where did he grow up? What was his childhood like? He was born in England. He grew up there. He was sent away for a while as a child because of the Blitz in London um, and had that, I think, traumatic experience. His family uh, was ambitious. He writes a lot about being sort of ambitious and Jewish in that period. Um, he was very uh, accomplished. Uh, he had what sounds in some ways like a little bit of an emotionally lonely childhood. And in one of the book's most poignant moments, he describes how he realizes 50 years later that his parents really did love him. but didn't realize that fully at the time. There was that terrible quote that you gave when he told his mother when he was 18 that he was gay, that she said, I wish you had never been born. Yes. His parents don't come off as enormously warm and supportive in this. And it seems that his own rather repressed relationship to his sexuality, which he doesn't fully play out in the book, uh, must have come to some extent from that sense of disapprobation around him. Um, his family didn't seem very approving of him, and that may be part of why he moved away. It may be part of what drove his investigation. Also, he had a brother who developed schizophrenia, and he was terrified by his brother. So I think it was a difficult and to some degree a lonely childhood, and I think a lot of the rest of his life has been a recovery from it. Does his obsession with bodybuilding and motorcycling and that kind of fit into that that adult life of kind of escaping or being on the move? or Well, he was always on the move. He was always going from one thing to another, going in some ways from one topic to another. Uh, yes, there is a sense that there were things he was running away from. And there's a sense some of the time that he wasn't running to anything in particular. He was sort of just running from and seeing where he ended up. 
the bodybuilding became a real obsession. I mean, he ended up uh, having what must have been a quite astonishing body. It's not photo illustrated in the book, <laughs> but he was lifting unbelievable amounts of weight, such huge amounts of weight that they actually, in the end, did some uh, permanent uh, neurological damage to him. But he was very obsessed with making his body sort of very big and very beautiful. And it's fascinating to read that and indeed to see the very handsome photo of him on the cover of the book because his photo has been widely circulated as his work has become more famous and has been on the cover of several of his books. And by and large, he doesn't look like the sort of um, muscly young stud that he was in his heyday. I think many people still think of him as Robin Williams from Awakenings. Exactly. Um, (laughs) In your review, you said this is more of a history of his career than an analysis. How introspective is he and and, um, how deeply does he go into his own uh, case history? There seem to be emotional pieces that are missing here. And to some extent, it seems as though it's not because he was deliberately being secret, but because they're outside of the way that he things. So he describes being gay, he describes a number of sexual encounters, and then he describes what was his last sexual encounter for several decades. But he doesn't say why it was his last encounter for several decades. He describes moments of difficulty in dealing with other people in professional contexts. But as he describes them, you think, really, you said that? And what did you expect was going to happen? Right. And he doesn't sort of go into it. And he doesn't, he doesn't delve in some ways. He delves into the details and the facts. But he doesn't seem to have much of what I suppose we would call a post-Freudian consciousness of really analyzing his motivations and really understanding what was going on at the level below consciousness. Um, he lays it all out. And then he leaves it for you to think, oh, he must have been motivated by this. Oh, he must have really thought that. What he does describe is this sort of almost childlike, naive excitement about the constant process of discovery that was his life's work. So that part of it is very much evident. But the other parts, the sadness sort of seeps out between the paragraphs. He never comes out and says, and then I was so sad. Do you feel like he has that his ability to understand and empathize with his patients is greater than his ability to do that sort of with his own story? I think he's very empathetic with his patients, and uh, I think his empathy with them sometimes has limits. I think that's part of what some people have objected to in his previous writing. In a way, what was almost reassuring in this book was to feel that his empathy with himself had the same limits, that he had extraordinary insight at one level and a certain emotional holding back at another level. And while at one level that sounds like a criticism and a flaw, at another level I think it was his ability to have that underlying emotional reserve deeply bred into many British people of his generation, of course, but to have that reserve that allowed him to go into such difficult terrain with so many patients who were so severely disabled and to write about them with such clarity. He brings the same resonance um, to his writing about himself. This book, um, On the Move, Oliver Sacks' memoir, was originally intended to be published this fall, and they moved the pub date up to the spring um, shortly after Sacks wrote an op-ed in, the, in this newspaper about his diagnosis with cancer. Is that written about in the book, or is it, does it, is it clear that the book was sort of finished up before he uh, received that diagnosis? Does he talk about his mortality? He talks about his mortality in more general terms, the specifics that are in that op-ed of the fact that he really is very sick and will not be alive for much longer don't enter in here. But it definitely feels like a memoir written from the end of life looking back. It's not a sort of midlife celebration. It's a, almost a, a sort of personal postmortem. All right. Well, it's a life I'm sure many listeners uh, will be interested in reading about. I think it's already on the bestseller list. Um, The book, again, is On the Move, A Life by Oliver Sacks and Andrew Solomon. Thank you so much for being here to talk about it. Pamela, always a joy. Andrew Solomon is the author, again, most recently of Far From the Tree, Parents, Children, and the Search for Identity, which was one of our best books of the year a couple years ago. And he is the current president of PEN America. And he is also a professor of clinical psychology at Columbia University Medical Center.
Greg Coles is here with Bestseller News, and it looks like he has a lot. Hi, Greg. Hi, Pamela. I do have a lot of news. Most of it's on the nonfiction side, but there are some new titles on the hardcover side this week, too. Starting down at number 15, Charlene Harris, uh, who you probably remember that after her um, Suki Stackhouse series ended last year, that's the the one that got turned into the True Blood series on HBO, um, she started a new series last year set in Midnight, Texas. This book, Day Shift, new at number 15, is uh, the second book in that series following Midnight Crossroad. Are these vampires? They are supernatural figures. A psychic is at the center of this book. Um, they're are vampires and, and other magical creatures. It, it's very much the same um, idea as Suki Stackhouse, um, but set in this small Texas town. In a very different vein, pun unintended. Uh, yeah, right. New at number six, also sort of the second book in a series, um, Kate Atkinson. Cover Girl last week? Yes, our cover girl last week, uh, has her novel A God in Ruins, which is sort of a follow-up or a companion volume to her big bestseller, Life After Life. Then new at number one is a novel called 14th Deadly Sin. That's by James Patterson and his uh, frequent co-writer Maxine Petro. It's uh, part of their Women's Murder Club series, book 14, as you might guess from the title. Patterson's official biography notes that in uh, 2013, it was estimated that one in five hardcover thrillers sold was a Patterson book. Sometimes uh, looking at the list, it feels as if one in five thrillers written ever is a Patterson book. And in true stories? Uh, Yes. On the nonfiction side of things, the first new title is down at number 10. It's a book called Deal by Bill Kreutzmann, who is the founding drummer for The Grateful Dead. He played with them for all 30 years of that band's existence. Uh, A memoir written with Benji Eisen about his uh, wild life and times with The Grateful Dead. They actually remember part of it. (laughs) He actually remembers quite a lot. It's a very conversational, uh, fun book if you're into the dead at all. Then at number seven, another memoir. Uh, This one's called American Wife. It's by Taya Kyle. She is the widow of Chris Kyle, who was uh, the Navy SEAL who went on to write American Sniper, uh, which, of course, got made into the movie. Taya Kyle writes this book with Jim DeFelice. Then at number six, another sort of memoir and uh, another survivor's story. It's by Melissa Rivers, who's Joan Rivers' daughter. Uh, She wrote a book called The Book of Joan that's looking back on life with her famous comedian mother. Then at number five, another memoir um, and another musician's story like the Bill Kreutzmann. Um, Willie Nelson has a book written with David Ritz called It's a Long Story. He too remembers. <laughs> Surprisingly, he too remembers. He's 82 years old now. He's about to launch his own um, brand of pot now that it's legal in a lot of places, a, a branded Willie Nelson cannabis product. Um, he writes here about his long love affair with marijuana. He uh, also writes about the tax problems he's had. It's not his first autobiographical book. Um, In 2012, he hit the list with Roll Me Up and Smoke Me When I Die. It's uh, a long story, (laughs) as he says. And in 2002, he also was on the list with Facts of Life and Other Dirty Jokes. Um, Then at number two, a political book, Peter Schweitzer's uh, book, Clinton Cash, makes its first appearance on the list. This is a book that has not come without some controversy. Schweitzer was formerly uh, with the Hoover Institution think tank. He's currently with the Government Accountability Institute, uh, which, like the Hoover Institution, is a conservative uh, think tank. He is not writing uh, without pretty clear agenda. But it doesn't mean that the journalism doesn't hold up. And uh, this book has gotten some attention for deals that Schweitzer made with the New York Times and the Washington Post to um, look into the journalism, to re-report some of it. And um, I mean, they're, they're taking a lot of it kind of at face value. It's a book that looks into the sources of the funding for Bill Clinton's, the, the Clinton Foundation. That's what this is, book is about. Finally, at number one, the historian David McCulloch, who's 81 years old now, has his 10th book. It is The Wright Brothers, not so much a biography of The Wright Brothers, um, but more a history of how they came to uh, make the first flight in 1903, the disputed first flight. There are other people uh, making a claim on it, but um, how how they came to be associated with um, flight for their first flight in 1903 um, and how it took some time for them to um, get the recognition for that. 
but not a lot of time for the book about them to hit the bestseller list. Thanks, Greg. (laughs) Thanks, Pamela. Remember, there's more at nytimes.com slash books. Our producer is Jocelyn Gonzalez, and you can always write to us at books at nytimes.com. Thanks for listening. For The New York Times, I'm Pamela Paul. Thank you.